All right, welcome everyone to the penultimate Open Ocean Summer Seminar. I'm Dr. Katie Croft Bell, Director of the Open Ocean Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. In case you've missed previous seminars, we have our spring and summer seminars posted online. In the chat, I'm putting the links to those as well as to our final summer seminar, which will happen in just two weeks. And now I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Sven Lindblad, founder and president of Lindblad Expeditions, an innovative travel company offering marine focused expeditions aboard small ships with a longstanding commitment to conservation. To do so, Lindblad has a strategic alliance with National Geographic to inspire curious people to explore and care about the planet. Sven is a staunch advocate for the value of travel as a positive force for the preservation of the world's remote places. With the collapse of ecotourism due to the COVID-19 pandemic, conservation is also in crisis with a major threat to the communities and wildlife that depend on it. From the plains of Africa to the world's marine protected areas, conservation to protect critical ecosystems relies heavily on tourism revenue and has been dealt a devastating blow. Today, Sven will share his belief that over-tourism is bad, but under-tourism is worse, and how today's conservation strategies must overtly maximize both biodiversity and the improvement of human well-being simultaneously. Joining us from French Polynesia, please welcome Sven Lindblad. Thank you. Uh, now I, I just have to do my first technical thing here. I want to share the screen now, yeah. Okay, and then I just... Uh, it right. looks great. All right, so so uh, can you all hear me? Uh, okay. Loud and clear. Loud um, and clear, good. So, so um, I'm going to show you kind of a, a, a distressing video in a second, but uh, I mean, for the last decade or so, uh, we spent a lot of time, a lot of us have spent a lot of time uh, worrying about what is the effect of of over tourism we, we've seen a we've seen a lot of places uh really overrun uh that has happened in towns and cities and certainly in in sort of wildlife rich areas uh national parks uh, we've all heard stories about yellowstone and, and various other national parks around the world and there's this been, been this sort of growing interest and this growing demand for uh, nature tourism. I mean, nature tourism at the moment in 2018, it was something like it, it, it was the something like $350 billion of economic activity. I mean, it's, it's just tremendous. It's growing leaps and bounds. The uh, sort of adventure travel is probably the largest, uh, has, represents the largest growth of any segment of the travel industry. Obviously, it's not the largest segment, but it's growing at the largest level. And so that's putting an inordinate amount of pressure on these places. And uh, for example, in my industry, uh, so I, I use small ships to take people to remote parts of the world focused on nature, culture, and history, primarily nature. <clears throat> and in the last couple of years, uh, there, there have been commitments to build something like 35 uh, quote unquote small expedition ships uh, and in the previous decades, you know, you would have one built in one year, maybe zero in the next, maybe two in a year. It was very, very slow development. And now all of a sudden it's just massively exploding. And so places like Antarctica, uh, where virtually all of these ships will wind up going in our winter, uh, you know, will put pressure on the system. There's no question. The Arctic, uh, and, and various remote places. And the biggest concern is partially the numbers, but also people perhaps that don't know what they're doing because they underestimate the complexity of these places. And uh, that has the possibility of, of, of uh, accidents happening and that has the possibility of pollution being created that people can wind up going into penguin colonies without the right protocols and causing damage. And so it, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So we've been incredibly worried about, um, about over tourism. I'm just going to show you a quick little video just to give you a, an image of that. Hey, babe, can you help me here? I pressed the down button and nothing happened. Whoops. Okay. 
So this, by the way, has nothing to do with us, but it is going to give you a little bit of flavor of, of, of over tourism. I mean, this is what tourism has become uh, in, or, or much of it has become just masses of people aggregating, congregating, crowding. Uh, it, it, it is in many instances, overwhelmed places. Uh, there are communities that, that, uh, that tourism, tourists outnumber residents at certain times of year. So it, it's, it's a pretty staggering effect. So one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest influences of this rise in tourism is or the biggest single influence is Chinese travel, right? So in, in 2018, 150 million Chinese traveled abroad. At the beginning of the millennium, it was somewhere around 10 million. So this is a massive, massive increase. Uh, there have been mass, uh, significant increases from other countries as well, but, but the China influence is, is hugely significant and it is growing by leaps and bounds, 15 plus percent a year. Uh, at the moment, some, something in that neighborhood. So there's just more and more and more and more people out there uh, taking advantage of and, and, and these wonderful assets that we, that we have in the world. And, and nature is both the beneficiary on some levels and, 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 and being disrupted on other levels. But now we have something that is unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this. Uh, and it is having a whole different kind of effect. So we've gone from over tourism, let's say 100, to essentially zero. And that happened overnight with no planning, uh, no opportunity to prepare. And the effects of that are, ha have shown to be uh, pretty devastating on a multitude of levels. I mean, when you think about most countries, uh, the protection of wildlife, national parks, wildlife, wild areas, uh, is always in competition with other economic pressures. Unfortunately, it's become a commodity in a sense. It has to pay for itself and everything is valued in economic terms. You know, when you think about it, we talk a lot about cost, 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 cost of maintaining something, uh, the, 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 the cost of not being able to do something, uh, for, for example, oil development, uh, mining, farming, agriculture of some form or another. I mean, the Serengeti National Park, for example, if it was not, if it did not pay its way with tourism, it would probably become a cornfield or some other agricultural, it would have some other agricultural value. And so, so wildlife uh, and nature is constantly in competition with other forms of economic development. That's really unfortunate. You, 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 know, you would prefer that we would have a world where you would put aside uh, a bunch of these areas purely from the perspective of that they add cultural value, they're part of your, your, your heritage, they represent your legacy, uh, they represent responsibility to our land etc cetera, etc cetera. but that's frankly not the case uh, it's all become economic in, in 90 plus percent of the cases so all of a sudden now you have no tourism or virtually no tourism in certain areas absolutely no tourism and there are a couple of things that are happening one is 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 it's creating vacuums in certain areas I, I used to live in Kenya in the in the in the seventies for seven years in the early seven in, in 1970, 1977. And during that time, one of the things that the president of Kenya decided to do was he decided, uh, I think it was 1975 or 76, I can't remember the exact date, date but he decided to cut uh, uh, to 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 stop hunting, professional hunting. Just to be clear, I, I'm not a hunter personally, I don't enjoy it, I don't like it. But I also recognize that it has an important role to play. Uh, and its primary role is presence. So you would have professional hunting in certain parts of the country, and that would create an activity and a presence. And that would, uh, in essence, diminish the ability of poachers to move freely in those areas. 
So while the idea of professional hunting is unattractive to some, it helped in many ways protect wildlife because of the presence. It also provided some significant income. And income, again, is, uh, is critical all the time. You know, and it's all, it's all necessary in order to keep this idea going and this idea of protecting wildlife going. So, so poaching increased dramatically as a consequence of, of hunting being stopped. So if you imagine now what's happening in many of these areas, <coughs> the, there, there is less presence. Rangers are not, being able to, uh, are not able to be paid because the money comes from, from, from tourism activities. Governments are tightening their belts all over the place because they don't have uh, that income. Uh, and and, and it, 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 I've spoken to more people every day. I speak to somebody who tells me some horror story about something that's going on somewhere in the world where uh, the lack of tourism is causing a significant problem. Uh, you have people like, uh, like, like, Tom, uh, Tommy Rengasamo in, 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 in Palau. So he declared 80% of his exclusive economic zone as a marine protected area. This was very common in their Congress. He fought hard for it. Uh, he won the, uh, this idea. He, 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 he believed it so, so strongly that this was an important opportunity for the country of Palau into uh, going forward into the future. So 20%, uh, the remaining 20% is allowed to be fished locally, uh, but a lot of fishermen uh, are, are upset that they can't fish uh, in more of it. And of course, the entire economy from the tuna licenses that he was providing or the country was providing before, the country now doesn't get the revenue from that. So now all of a sudden, tourism, which was the industry that would compensate for that revenue is, is, is gone for the time being. And it's going to put a lot of pressure on that decision, that monumental decision to protect 80% of the EEC, which is really a, an unbelievable tragedy if that gets reversed. Because not only, was that, not only was that a great idea for Palau, but it became an example that based on how it would play out over the years would act as, 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 as a teacher to other places and other countries and, and illuminate opportunities that they might not have recognized. Of course, hopefully they'll be able to sustain this commitment and it won't be reversed. But if something like this goes on much longer, it puts such inordinate pressure on, on the economic system and, and, and the, you know, the people who want to catch the tuna in these waters and, and, and the fishing industry is just waiting and is lobbying and is so ready to get back in there full force. Some of you might have read there's a, there's a fleet of, I don't know, 200 and some fishing boats sort of aggregated right outside the Galapagos uh, Marine Protected Area, uh, just waiting. To, to go in there and knowing full well that the government doesn't have the resources to patrol and police that area. So they, they may be already, or they may be shortly going in there and, 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 and really taking out a lot of fish and sharks in particular, because nobody's there to, uh, nobody can police it because the resources aren't there. So at the end of the day, I'm just gonna show you a few pictures about the, the fact that there is this enormous hunger to go out and see wildlife. It is putting pressure on places, but it is also valuable from the perspective of it gives a reason for them, for these places to be protected. And the smarter we get over time about how we integrate uh, the possibility of human interaction with these places with uh, greater understanding of the importance of conservation and the importance of protecting these places, that represents a huge opportunity. Because, I mean, if you just, if you take our company, for example, and I'm not here to talk about our company, but we, we handle about 20 to 23,000 people a year. 
we take them to places like Antarctica and beyond. We have nine ships, they're all over the world, as I said, focusing on nature, culture, and history. But one of the things that we want to do, and one of the reasons we exist, is to plant seeds in people's heads about the importance of conservation, the fact that natural systems are essential to our well-being, and also, uh, you know, that, that, that wildlife is part of the entire system of life and ought to have rights and ought to be allowed to exist uh, and ought to be protected, just like we protect or attempt to protect each other in certain instances, not, not, not as much as we should, but nevertheless. Um, so what we want to do is plant those seeds. And what we also want to do is, is, is encourage people to participate in funding various activities. So to date, we, you know, at the moment, we raise close to a couple, about a couple of million dollars a year that we funnel into various projects, including the one I'm going to show you a video of just now, which we believe is an essential idea. It's a, it's a program by, uh, developed by a guy called Enrique Sala, who um, works together with National Geographic, and he has a program called Pristine Seas. So he's been at the forefront of, or, or Pristine Seas has been at the forefront of the creation of, of something like 22 uh, marine protected, large marine protected areas, over 5 million square kilometers of ocean. Uh, and it, to, as far as we're concerned, that's a really important idea. Uh, setting aside large swaths of ocean to be protected, which then also has to be combined, of course, with, uh, with systems that actually monitor and enforce the protection. Uh, that's the second part of the equation. Uh, and he's made great, great strides in, in that regard. A lot of those strides pr probably are going to be threatened as a consequence of of COVID, some already have, uh, and, and we're all kind of really, really worried about this, but we have to really, so let me just backtrack. Sorry, I'm a little all over the place because my mind, one of the things that happened has happened to me in this period is there's so much incoming shit, frankly, that has to be dealt with every day as a consequence of this, because this is very, very, very complicated. It's very, very complicated as a business, uh, and it's very complicated just if you care at all about what the world, it's just it's just, it's like masses of bad news. So you're sort of looking for, for good news periodically, but it really plays with your brain. And so it's, it's, if, I, if I'm a little disorganized in this talk, it's because, exactly what I am, a little bit disorganized at the moment. So, uh, but in any case, we were really making some, when I say we, I mean collectively in the world, we were making some real progress prior to COVID, dealing with, or really recognizing that more of the ocean needed protection, that the ocean mattered a great deal. And in the last sort of five, six years, there's been more progress than there's been in, you know, many, many years prior and it was really exciting to see that sort of emergence of 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 it not enough necessarily but still positive movement we were also talking a lot more about climate and why it matters and is the key issue that we as human beings have to face that was getting some more traction again not enough but on an accelerated level and covid is going to completely put all of that on the back burner again, in all likelihood. I, re I remember in 2008, I took a group of people to the Arctic. I, I, I wanted to put together a, a, or arrange a convening of people in the business sector, in the science sector, in the political sector, uh, and in the religious sector, because the religious sector uh, creates a lot of communication around how climate change could be uh, dealt with more effectively across sectors. So it was an extraordinary group of people. Jimmy Carter, Ted Turner, Madeleine Albright, uh, uh, the CEO of Monsanto, of DuPont, of Shell, uh, Walter Isaacson and Aspen Institute moderated the whole thing. Uh, the, Larry Page from uh, Google was there, uh, and on and on and on. There were 90 extraordinary people. 
And the commitments that were made during that trip and the, the bonding that took place, we were together for nine days, uh, and, and, and the commitments, uh, particularly as it related to creating a, a vibrant uh, effort to teach members of Congress about the importance of this, what was really, really staggering. I'll never forget at the airport at the end of this, people were crying because they had never spent time focused like this and developed such an, uh, and developed an ability to speak with people that they would never speak with normally and that might have been adversaries in other circumstances. Right? That was in July of 2008. In September of 2008, the economy crashed and climate disappeared for quite some time. It just like disappeared, went, went off the radar. Uh, nobody was talking about it anymore because again, we're so dominated by the economy and, uh, and if anything threatens the economy, everything else basically just disappears. So we have to be prepared. People in, in, the, in the conservation community have, uh, have to be prepared for the fact that, uh, and people who care about things like climate change and you know, ocean health and that the resources and the commitments that are going to be uh, provided or go towards that, uh, certainly on governmental, uh, on governmental levels, are probably going to diminish. It's, it's inevitable. But let me just show you this little film about pristine seas, which will give you a specific sense about that effort. When I was in my 20s, I remember swimming amongst fields of Elkhorn coral, surrounded by sharks and large fish, and I just thought that was normal. Well, it isn't anymore. Growing up on the Mediterranean coast of Spain, I was fascinated by Jacques Cousteau's films. He showed us such underwater richness, large fish, healthy reefs, sharks, when I went swimming in the Mediterranean, in the same sea, I didn't see any of them. The Mediterranean was almost dead. In the mid-90s, I went back to the Mediterranean that I knew as a child. The first dive I did, a small marine reserve that had been protected for over 10 years. Everything that Gusto showed us was there. That day I know that if we are able to protect places, our in life will come back. We've got to ensure that there are places, not just a few, lots of them, where corals thrive, where large fish live, where the system is in balance. Only 1% of the ocean is protected. 99% of the ocean where there is fishing is like a debit account. Everybody withdraws, but nobody makes a deposit. Why would we allow our generation to preside over the bankruptcy of our ocean? There are still a few places that are untouched places that look like the ocean of 1,000 years ago. These places are the only baselines we have to understand what we have lost. But most important, they are a blueprint to help us determine what type of future In the last five years, we have visited nine of the most remote places in the ocean and we have inspired leaders to protect five of them, some of the largest marine reserves on the planet. Our goal for the next five years is to target the 20 most pristine places left in the ocean. Together with our partners, our team is going to build the largest ocean legacy in human history. Enrique Sala and his team, they are heroes. They are heroes of our planet. Creating large marine protected areas and managing them effectively 
will not only preserve the unique marine life forever, but also it will provide the resilience that we need for a healthy ocean. They are the most valuable gems left on our planet. Just don't disturb it all the time. You don't withdraw from it all the time. You don't destroy it all the time. It will regenerate itself. You just need to give it time. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, so we, when I say we, uh, those of us who think about these things and who spend either our entire lives or a portion of our lives uh, trying to figure out how we are going to uh, save our natural systems from crashing uh, to the best of our ability, we're going to probably have to pick up a lot of slack because there's, 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 there's just going to be all kinds of entities uh, out there that are going to have diminished capacity to do that. Uh, and we also have to recognize that there's going to be a, and we have to figure out how not to get too despondent about that, that there's going to be for a period of time, uh, fewer ears willing to to listen to or to care significantly about these issues because they have other significant pressures that they deem to be more important or more critical. So many people are going to lose their jobs. So many people already have. So many people more will. Uh, we are, I think we're only at the early stages of really beginning to feel the economic impact that this horrible uh, virus is going to create. And tourism is going to attempt to recover because the pressure is so great. And so it's going to be a battle between economic concern, legitimate economic concern, we're trying to figure out how to get back into business, and medical concerns or health concerns. I mean, right here now in Polynesia, uh, this uh, French Polynesia was COVID free for two months. It uh, decided to, to, that it would allow visitors to come in with a rigorous protocol, testing within 72 hours, PCR testing within 72 hours, uh, filling out a form uh, with, with some very serious sort of medical questions, and then another second test self-administered four days after arrival uh, and 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 they thought this through and it's I think it's probably one of the, the best systems that I've seen certainly for entering a country but already there's a few cracks showing in that effort and there have been a few cases and every day now there are a few more and you know the country could shut down at any moment and the country is devastated uh, because tourism has been eliminated and, and it's a key part of their economy, the key part of their economy. And uh, so I'm sitting here and recognizing that there's a very good chance that there might not be a plan to get me out of here next week. Um, and I'm not worried about that so much, but I am worried about the fact that, you know, there are a lot of people here who are already out of work and a lot more that will will be out of work and that will put so many things that have made such pro uh, positive progress on the back burner. I don't mean, I think I'm going on and on about that too much, but I just, everywhere I look, it's same damn story. And we're gonna have to grapple with it, wrestle with it, not allow ourselves to get too depressed and find creative strategies to do workarounds uh, because we can't obviously abandon the importance of natural systems and the natural world because it obviously is so critical to us and, and you know i suppose there's one uh there's one hope which is that uh, one hope which is really important i believe and that everybody who's 
uh, even thinking about not going out there and voting in November is, is, is that's a really bad idea because we need a change. And we, although whatever change is not necessarily going to be a panacea, I believe if there is a change in government, it's certainly going to be better than it is now because right now uh, you have a virtual assault on natural systems. Uh, and, and, and combine that with COVID, and that's a really, really bad formula. Uh, at least if we have a change of government, there'll be a counter to that assault, uh, and that will mitigate uh, some of the negative effects, which are pretty essential. So I am going to uh, stop here because I really want to have an opportunity to answer any questions. I just put these slides in just to give us a reminder of how wonderful the world is. <laughs> and it really is, and it really is so worth protecting. I'll just show you this little thing on Baja, California. You know, it's funny, Baja, California, I don't know how many of you have been there, but this is one of the great uh, natural environments uh, in the world and is so close to home. Uh, it has uh, suffered from overfishing, certainly, uh, but it's still a magnificent, magnificent place. But I'm gonna be watching Baja very, very closely because there, 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 there was a, uh, there's a lot of work been done there to prevent overdevelopment. Uh, and some really powerful forces have managed to prevent a lot of overdevelopment. But of course, now post COVID, any conversation of restraint is going to be much more strained uh, because people want to get back. But if you haven't been to Baja California, you should try and get there at some point. 